What do we mean by having an appetite for bad news? Well, you're the leader. Let's say you're the team lead. You're the department head. Even the business owner. Perhaps just this morning, somebody gave you a piece of bad news. Can be anything. Sir, we lost an account. Sir, if fuel cost being what it is now, our costs are skyrocketing. Or if you're running a factory like I do, sir, our machine has broken down. Or it may even be a conflict with somebody you work with. And you are the leader. You got these problems. You're expected to deal with them. And how your organization runs will depend on how you respond. And I learned this from an expat wherein he said, he told his team, you guys, you're free to come to me anytime with any problem. Don't be afraid that I'll be pissed off. Don't be afraid that I'll get mad at you. Remember, I have an appetite for bad news. And if you're the kind of guy who eats problems for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, congratulations. You have that appetite too. And so what we're going to do is that I'll give a story. And while it is from a manufacturing perspective, the lessons, the three R's, will be applicable to anyone, anywhere. And to give you a bit about myself, I'm a chemical engineer, I have a business degree, and I run two factories. And one day, I was looking forward to a smooth day, no problem, no machine breakdown, no systems failure, just a smooth sailing, boring can be good. And that kind of serenity shattered when I got this phone call from my direct report. He's my production head. Let's call him Adrian. And Adrian said, Sir Nelson, Nako, we have a problem. And I was thinking like, Patay, ano ito? And, but of course, I didn't tell Adrian that. But I kept calm and said, what is our problem? And he said, Sir, our lubricating oil will run out in three weeks. When that happens, we have to shut down all the machines. And that means we cannot produce. And as soon as he said that, I was thinking nightmare scenario, and I'm still awake. I'm having nightmares while being awake. I was thinking our noisy factory will go to a standstill like a ghost town. We cannot serve our customers, and I can hear them screaming for their orders. And worse, I may lose my job. But I kept calm and said, okay, help me understand, Adrian, the problem. What is this oil all about again? And explain. What led to the shortage? He explained also. Okay, okay. And then I began probing. Have you ever considered this? What if that? What are your recommendations? After that, we went into a problem-solving session, which I'll tell you in the latter part of this talk. But notice what happened. We're able to implement a culture of psychological safety. Now, psychological safety, many of you may have heard of this. Amy Edmondson, a Harvard professor, defined it as a shared belief that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. Adrian took a risk in telling me about the problem. Lubricating oil will run out in three weeks. We can shut down. And of course, his neck is on the line too. But he took the risk knowing that we created this environment where people can say anything they want even problems, they feel safe without feeling any negative consequences. And that's what happened. And later on, we're going to show you how to create that psychological safety with this thin but crucial factor. There are many webinars on psychological safety. They're on a macro view, but for the next 30 minutes, this will be the critical part. The way you, the leader, respond to problems can make or break psychological safety. Now let's do a little diagnostic question. Reflect with me. Can you and your people freely talk about problems? Can they count on you to remain calm and constructive? Are you known for not shooting the messenger? You know how it is, right? Being shot and shooting. Tell me more about it. If the answer is yes, congratulations. You have this appetite for bad news. And here's also how to enhance that appetite. Today, I'm going to share you the three R's. Where I use it on Adrian, 
and you can use it on your people even after this call. The first principle is to reflect. The coaching question begins with what makes you respond the way you respond? For example, if people go to you with bad news, you get rattled, you get irritated, you get panicky. Why is that? Why do I feel this way? Well, I know I should fare better, but why is it that when people give me bad news, I'm afraid or I lose my cup? Why? And when you have that kind of reflection, it's step one to be the leader who can attack problems and be the role model to your followers. One example is this. For example, I may have this kind of goal. I'm a big believer in personal branding. And so my goal is this. I want to be known as a competent leader. Then Adrian tells me, Sir Nelson, we have a problem. <gasps> and if this thing fails, if the plan is shut down, what will happen? My goal is threatened. I'll be known as an incompetent leader. How come Nelson let that happen? He's not a good leader after all. And when that happens, when Adrian gives me that problem, if I have the kind of mindset, what will happen? I will respond with panic or anger. But, now, but knowing your goal as how it contributes to the way you respond can help you rather than hinder you. Let's flip it. What if the reason why you res respond the way you do is because the goal is to be known as a competent leader. And when you heard the bad news, you solve the problem and you'll be even more known as a competent leader. See the reversal. So whatever is the reason, the emotional trigger that made you respond to problems poorly, you can flip it as long as you're aware of what makes you respond to problems the way you respond. Second, remember, all those reflection is a start, but we do not work by ourselves. We work with other people. And that brings us to principle number two, relate. And the coaching question now becomes, what kind of relationships do you want? By the way, this can also be applicable to personal relationships like marriage. But here for workplace, like, okay, what kind of a team do you want to have? What kind of office environment do you want to have? And of course, I would like to have a high-performing team, people with high morale, very motivated, and they can talk freely about issues without fear of blame or shame, psychological safety. When that happens, I now have to think, if I'm giving a problem and I respond, I have to think ahead, how will this affect my relationships? And that is why I was so careful with responding to Adrian. Imagine if this happens, let's look at square number one. If Adrian were to tell me, Sir Nelson, we have a problem, and I lash out, what kind of operation are you doing? Don't you know what you're, how you're doing? It's a bunch of idiots. What will happen? Or what if I do it this way? I will be in dismay. Oh no, what will happen? I, I can't handle it. What would this happen to why me? Chances are, Adrian will think twice before coming back to me with a problem. He may even hide the problem until the problem becomes too deep, too big, or too expensive to fix. But if I send the signal, Adrian, you can come to me anytime with any problem. I have an appetite for bad news. I'll be in square number three. Look at it calmly, constructively. And that leads to an environment where we can move forward rather than shooting people down. And what happens when you have that kind of reflection, why you respond the way you respond, and also now you're able to relate well with people, what about the problem itself? Here comes the third principle. It is to reframe. What do problems mean to you? Check out LJMB online. Look for Louis Banta's excellent e-learning course, Introduction, to problem solving and decision making. One of the great things you will learn is that problems are opportunities. Type in the chat box, problems are opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. Because if you see problems as failure, hassle, shame, stress, then of course you'll respond poorly and therefore you reflect poorly on others. But if you view them as 
opportunities, you'll be able to respond well. It's an opportunity to improve. And you can also relate well to people. Let's solve the problem together positively. I gave you the story about the lubricating oil. What happened? Well, here's what happened. We had this brainstorming session. It's not just Adrian, the production head. It's also the planner, the process engineer, and the QA manager. It's an interfunctional endeavor. And remember, we're supposed to reflect why we respond, the way we respond, and we all agree. We look at it without blaming, no finger pointing, ikaw kasi. No, woe is me. And we try to see the options. It was a lively discussion, but let me summarize with this slide. And you will know this as a why, why. First question, why will we run out of oil in three weeks? Because we place an order, but supplier cannot replenish on time. Duh, of course. Why can't supplier replenish on time? Because he doesn't keep stock. Okay, so why doesn't he keep stock? Because first he has to import the oil. Ah, so this supplier is a trader, so he has to first get it from Germany or US. And supply chain being what it is now, it's no wonder that the shipment is late and it will not come before the three weeks. And so what happens? We ask the next logical question. We even had a phone call, a teleconference with the supplier. How come you're not importing and keep it on stock so that we can get it off the shelf? He explained, Sir Nelson, your oil is a special blend. It's a slow moving item. We will import only when you order it. Because if I order it, if I import it and you're not getting it, that's a waste of my money. Now we understand. If we're not for this problem, that blind spot would not have been revealed. It was an opportunity to improve. What did we do? First, with the plan A, we gave the supplier a solution. Okay, so you're afraid that you will import but will not order. Here's what we'll do. We'll issue you a blanket PO. We commit to buy X amount of stuff from you given a certain schedule. Go ahead and import them. You're protected. Plan B, what about the three weeks? Fortunately, my process engineer said, sir, I was Googling. I was able to find another supplier. Same kind of oil, different brand. Same specs, same everything. And we're getting it through special messenger. And it worked. We're able to keep the machine sustaining while the late shipment from the first supplier is coming in. What happened? This problem, this bad news, because we're able to respond well, and because of that, we're able to relate well to each other, became an opportunity to improve. We strengthened an existing supplier, issue blanket PO. We also expanded our supplier portfolio. We have this alternative brand. And so now, we didn't have to worry about plant shutdown. Perhaps this morning, as I said, you must have given a piece of bad news. Whatever it is, sales, finance, human resources, manufacturing. And maybe this thing will flow over after this lunchtime, in which case I do hope you'll be able to apply these three principles so that you'll be able to deal with bad news well. Principle number one is to reflect what makes you respond the way you respond. Principle number two is to relate. What kind of relationships do you want? And then you have to respond accordingly to the to have the relationship that you want. Last but not least, now you have your own self-awareness and the teamwork, you attack the problems together, reframe it by saying, what do problems mean to you? In this case, opportunity. When that happens, you will have a fantastic reputation. You'll be known for turning bad news into good news. And that is great news.